In the 1960s, Alan Burkhardt opened a riverfront restaurant in Beaumont, Texas. And for the next 50 plus years, his customers would eat burgers, drink beers, and on super hot days, they would jump off the pier into the river to cool down. But one day in June of 2015, while Alan was in his restaurant looking out the back window, he saw something strange in the river. When he went outside to get a better look, he noticed his customers who were eating outside had also noticed this strange thing, and now they were standing up and nervously watching it as it floated by. Alan immediately yelled out to everyone to not go swimming, obviously, based on what they were seeing, and then he went back inside and made a sign that said no swimming, and he posted it on the pier. A few weeks later, on July 2nd, a 28-year-old local man named Tommy Woodward and his girlfriend, Victoria LeBlanc, arrived at Alan's restaurant for a fun night out. After several hours of drinking and playing pool, Tommy and his girlfriend made their way over to the bar and had a seat, at which point Tommy began telling his girlfriend that he planned on going Going swimming in the river that night. The bartender overheard him and said, Tommy, you can't go swimming in the river anymore. But Tommy was a bit of a rule breaker and said he didn't care, he was going to go anyways. The bartender began pleading with him and even got other staff members of the restaurant to talk sense into Tommy that he should not get in the water. But eventually Tommy just stood up, he grabbed his girlfriend's hand, left the restaurant and began walking down towards the pier. The bartender at this point just kind of rolled her eyes and thought, I can't do anything to stop him. And so she went back to her bartending duties. When Tommy and Victoria got down to the pier, the black water was quiet and calm as Tommy took off his shirt and removed his valuables from his pockets. Right before Tommy was about to jump into the water, Victoria stopped him and said she thought she saw something moving underneath the pier. But Tommy just laughed and said he didn't care and jumped into the water and disappeared below the surface. Immediately, the water around Tommy seemed to erupt like a bomb had gone up underneath him. When Tommy came back up to the surface, he was screaming and trying to swim back to the pier, but before he could get there, something pulled him under the water. And then a few seconds later, Tommy came back up again, and this time Victoria could see the left side of his torso was bleeding profusely. And so she instinctively leapt into the water to try to save him. And Tommy, even though he knew he needed help, he said to her, get back on land, save yourself. And so she obliged. She climbed back onto the pier, and when she turned around, she caught a final glimpse of Tommy as he was pulled back under the water and this time he did not come back up again. The bartender had heard screaming and so ran down with a flashlight to the pier and when she got there Victoria was hysterical and she was yelling Tommy's name and looking out over the water and so the bartender at this point is reasonably certain she knows what happened to Tommy but if by some miracle he's still alive she wants to find him and so she raises her flashlight and she began scanning the now totally calm black water and as she's scanning she finds him. He's floating face down way off in the middle of the river and as soon as the flashlight hits him something pulls his body under the water and he disappears from view. It was no secret that the river that ran next to Alan's restaurant was home to alligators but these alligators were small and they didn't bother anybody and so the locals really didn't have any issue swimming with them. In fact they had nicknamed two of the alligators that were seen the most often. They named them Cheeto and Marshmallow but on that day in June of 2015 when Alan and the other guests saw this thing out in the river, what they were seeing was a monster alligator, the likes of which they had never seen before in this river. It was at least 11 feet long and over 400 pounds, and that summer it decided to make the underside of Allen's Pier its home. And so that night when Tommy leapt into the water, it was this monster alligator's feeding time. And so Tommy became its dinner. About two hours after Tommy was attacked, what was left of him was recovered from the river. Tommy became the first alligator related fatality in Texas in nearly 200 years. Just north of San Francisco, California, lies Lake Berryessa, which is a massive freshwater reserve that provides drinking water and hydroelectricity to hundreds of thousands of people. The lake is not a natural occurrence. A dam was built in the area in the 1950s, and after it was in place, the water that pooled above it became Lake Berryessa. During the dam's construction, the engineers realized the structure would not be enough to keep all the water in if the lake were to flood. To solve this problem, the engineers installed what's called a spillway in the middle of the lake. 
A spillway is like a huge drain. When the water levels in the lake are normal, none of the water will go into this drain. But when water levels reach a certain point, the water, instead of spilling over the side of the dam, will spill into this spillway, and it will travel 200 feet straight down the 78-foot wide pipe. And when it reaches the bottom, the pipe bends sharply to the right, and the water is shot out on the other side of the dam into a creek. On a summer day in 1997, 41-year-old graduate student Emily Schwelich was swimming in the recreational side of Lake Berryessa. That evening, before she got out of the water, she decided she wanted to have a closer look at the spillway, which at the time, because the water levels had risen high enough, water was pouring down into the spillway. So Emily turned around and began casually swimming away from the recreational area towards the center of the lake. At some point, she would have seen signs poking out of the water, and she would have seen them on land, telling her to stay back. After passing those signs, she would have reached a long line of red caution buoys that were the last line of defense to try to keep people back from the spillway. But Emily went under those buoys and continued on towards this huge drain. Meanwhile, the other swimmers that had seen Emily take off towards the middle of the lake, they didn't think she would actually get close to the spillway. Nobody went close to the spillway, and so nobody tried to stop her. Around 6.10 p.m., Emily made it to right before the edge of the spillway. It would have been deafeningly loud as 360,000 gallons of water poured over the edge into the spillway every second. Emily most likely was trying to get right up to the edge and then grab that outer cement lip and kind of anchor herself and then lean over the edge and get a look down into the hole. But what ended up happening is as she got closer and closer to the edge, the current picked up so dramatically that it began pulling her down into the hole. And so by the time she's over the cement lip, she had already turned around realizing her mistake and was trying desperately to swim away from the spillway but it was too late. Her legs got whipped around and sucked down into the spillway, and she managed to grab onto the lip, the outer lip of the spillway, with her legs now in the spillway. Thousands and thousands of gallons of water are pouring down on her face, and so she can't pull herself back up. So she's pinned inside the spillway. People on land noticed this happening to her, but they realized there was nothing they could do to help her. If they tried to go down there and pull her out, they would get sucked in too. And so they called the authorities who have the right equipment to pull her out. But by the time they got out there, it was too late. Emily had managed to hang on to that edge for 20 minutes, but finally the water overpowered her, she lost her grip, and she fell backwards down the 200 foot chute to her death. On August 6, 2018, a manager at a grocery store in Lancaster, California, which is a town about an hour north of Los Angeles, started getting complaints from his staff and from customers about a terrible smell coming from the front of the building. The manager, who had come in the back door that day and so hadn't smelled anything, began walking through the store towards the front in order to investigate. He only made it to the cash registers before he had to throw his arm over his mouth and his nose because the whole front half of the store reeked. The manager's first thought was that food must have somehow fallen somewhere out of view and it was rotting and that was causing the smell. But when he went past the cash registers and went out the front doors, the smell got exponentially worse and he noticed the smell was predominantly coming from this brown liquid on the ground that seemed to be leaking out of the base of one of the pillars that lined the front of the store. And so the manager thought, well, it can't be food that's causing the smell. It's gotta be a sewer pipe leak that's happened right underneath this pillar and it's seeping up through the cement and that's what's causing the smell. And so the manager went back inside the store and he called a plumber, and then a couple of hours later, the plumber showed up. The manager pointed at the brown liquid out on the front and explained what he thought was going on, and the plumber looked at it and then looked at the manager and said, there's no sewer pipe underneath here. So whatever that liquid is, it's coming from inside the pillar. And so the manager was stumped because this pillar and all the others in the front of the store were purely decorative. There's no reason anything would be leaking out from inside of them. There was nothing inside of them. And so the manager asked the plumber to pull off one of the bricks around the area where this liquid was coming from so they could see what was on the other side. And so the plumber got his crowbar and he began prying off one of the bricks. And then once it was loose enough, he pulled the brick away, revealing an opening into the pillar. And the two men got down and they looked inside and what they saw horrified them. And they immediately backed up and they called the police. Five days earlier, a 35-year-old man named Ray Rivera was pulled over by Lancaster, California police on suspicion 
suspicion of driving a stolen vehicle. As soon as the officer got out of their cruiser and began approaching Ray's vehicle, Ray peeled off down the road, turned the corner, and was gone. The officer immediately got back in their cruiser and took off after Ray, but he had gotten a huge jump start and he had fled into a highly populated and busy area where it would be relatively easy to blend in and disappear. The officer called for backup and before long, there were dozens of other cop cars in the area looking for Ray, but no one could find him. A little while later, the police heard over the radio that a car matching the description of the one Ray had been driving had just crashed into a local grocery store. And so the police head over to the grocery store and sure enough, there's Ray's white pickup truck crashed into the side of the building, but Ray is nowhere to be found. The police began asking witnesses at the store if they had seen the man driving the white pickup truck and a few said they had. They said after he crashed, he leapt out of the vehicle and he ran inside the grocery store and then went up a flight of stairs to the staff only area. The police went inside the grocery store and searched the staff only area and they searched the rest of the grocery store, but he wasn't there. And so they assumed at some point after going inside, he managed to slip back out again and had escaped on foot. And so the police, just as a precaution, stayed outside of this grocery store for several more hours in case if Ray was in there, they would catch him trying to leave. But after a couple of hours, he never did. And so they put out a warrant for his arrest and they left. Well, it would turn out Ray had run inside the grocery store, but he had never left. After running up to that staff only area, he found a crawl space and he hid inside of it for several hours until the police left. And then at some point that evening, he decided he wanted to find a better hiding spot. And so he made his way onto the roof. Now it's not entirely clear how he did that. Either the crawl space he was in directly connected to the roof or he got out of the crawl space and then found his way onto the roof another way. But regardless, he found his way onto the roof. And when he got up there, he realized the roof was totally flat until you got to the very front edge of the building, the part that looked down into the parking lot. There on the roof was this small structure that was built up just on the front end of the roof that gave the impression from the parking lot looking up that this building was a lot bigger than it really was. On the back side of this phony structure was a door that was accessible from the roof. Ray saw this access door and ran over to it. He tried the handle and it was unlocked. And so he opened it up and he went inside. Now this attic like space that sat on the front of the building really didn't have that much of a purpose to it. However, it did provide access to the insides of all of the pillars that lined the front of the store. And so it's believed that Ray, as soon as he walked inside, saw these openings and believed one of them would be the perfect hiding place. And so he lowered himself feet first into one of these hollow chutes. He got his feet and his legs, his hips, and most of his torso into this tight nine inch by 17 inch space, but his shoulders were too broad. They would not fit into the pillar. And so he raised one arm over his head and he kept his other arm pinned by his side in order to make himself as narrow as possible. And this worked. Inch by inch, he began sliding deeper and deeper into this two story tall pillar until he was completely out of sight. But as soon as his shoulders had gone down into that pillar, he would have realized he had made a grave mistake. With one arm pinned above his head and the other pinned by his side, he would not have been able to pull himself back up out of this narrow space. He was stuck. And so he probably began squirming and trying to use his feet to try to get back up into the attic space. But all of that movement only made him slip farther and farther down into this pillar until his feet touched the ground at the absolute bottom. And so not only is he already in this totally compromised position that would have made it hard to breathe, he was also in such a narrow space that the walls of this pillar literally were crushing his chest, making it nearly impossible to get a full breath of air. And when he screamed out for help, nobody would have heard him because he was entombed inside of multiple layers of cement and brick. Also, making an already horrible situation that much worse, Lancaster, California was experiencing a very significant heat wave that month. And so all day long, the sun would have been blazing down on the outside of that pillar, heating up the inside like an oven. Five days after Ray got trapped, the plumber removed that brick on the pillar and he and the store manager bent down and looked and they saw Ray's leg. The smelly brown liquid that had been coming out of the pillar that had alerted everyone to this in the first place was purge fluid, which is something that comes out of a decomposing body. If you got something out of today's episode and you haven't done this already, please replace the like button's eye drops with acid. In the early 1960s, two high school classmates in South Carolina named Carol and Reggie fell in love with each other. 
Every day in the halls, they'd hold hands and they'd laugh with each other and whisper to each other. And then outside of school, they were inseparable. But despite their seemingly perfect relationship, it didn't last long. They both had different ideas about what the future should hold. And so after graduation, they broke up. Reggie went on to join the US Navy where he served for a number of years all over the world. He would at one point get married, but that marriage would end quickly. And then after he got out of the military, he got a job at a railroad back at his hometown in South Carolina. As for Carol, after graduation, she got married and divorced too, twice actually, but it was her second failed marriage that nearly killed her. On February 18th, 1987, Carol was living with her 10 year old daughter Rhonda in South Carolina when her estranged second husband came up to the door and knocked. Carol opened the door and her ex-husband drew a gun and shot her six times in front of her daughter before turning around and fleeing. The police would later find his body inside of his car on the side of the road. He had shot himself. As for Carol, the doctors were able to save her life, but the injuries she sustained from the attack were crippling. She was blind in one eye and she had chronic pain, and so her young daughter had to start taking care of her full time. Over the next eight years, Carol steadily improved and regained some of her independence, but in 1995, she had a huge setback. She started feeling ill, and so she went in to see a doctor, and the doctor did a blood test, and they discovered she had liver cancer. It would turn out the blood that was given to her after the attack that had been transfused into her body to save her life, it had been tainted with hepatitis C. And so she got hepatitis C without realizing it, and because it had been untreated, it led to liver cancer. Rhonda remembers when her mother came home after being given this terrible news, she just sat down and was silent for a minute, and then she just kind of muttered to herself, I just can't get away from this man. He's killing me all over again. But despite being dealt such an unfair hand in life, Carol was determined to not let her injuries or her illness define her. And so she went out looking for a job that could accommodate her physical limitations, and she found it. She was hired as a part-time customer service rep for a television cable company. She was very happy about this job and very proud of it because it was the first time she was working after the attack and so for once it felt like her life was going back to normal again. A few years later in 2000 when Carol was working at the cable company her phone rang and she answered it the way she answered every other call but the voice she heard on the other end she immediately recognized. He introduced himself as Reggie Sumner and so Carol asked him are you the Reggie Sumner from 1962 at Garrett High School in South Carolina? And he said, yeah, that's me. And Carol said, I'm your ex-girlfriend. We dated in high school. And so it was this incredible reunion, this totally chance phone call. And for the next hour or so, they just chatted on the phone about everything from their kids to their relationships they've been in to what they're up to now. I mean, they had a lot to catch up on since they hadn't seen or heard from each other in nearly 40 years. And so before they hung up, they realized they lived near each other. And so they made plans to get together in person. Rhonda would say her mother, when she came home that night, was like a 16 year old girl all over again. She she talked endlessly about how great Reggie was and how good looking he was and how excited she was about their upcoming date. And so a couple of days later, Carol and Reggie have this date. And when Carol comes home, Rhonda would say it was obvious her mother had fallen head over heels in love with Reggie all over again. And luckily, Reggie had fallen in love with Carol too, because less than six months later, they got married and became Mr. and Mrs. Sumner. Within a year of their marriage, they decided to sell their home in South Carolina and move to Jacksonville, Florida to retire. Even though caring for her mother for all those years had been quite difficult for Rhonda, she said she was very sad to see her mother go, but at the same time, she was really happy for her because it seemed like she had found the one. Over the next couple of years, Rhonda stayed in touch with her mother, speaking to her almost every single day on the phone. But in July of 2005, Rhonda's mother stopped answering her phone. At first, Rhonda wasn't that concerned, but after 24 hours of not hearing from her mother or from Reggie, she did get concerned. Because even though Reggie was able to care for Carol, he wasn't in the best shape himself. He had debilitating diabetes and he had recently broken his leg and so was largely confined to a wheelchair. And so if they were to leave their house for an extended period of time, they wouldn't do it without asking for help from Rhonda. And so over the next couple of days, Rhonda incessantly called her mother and called Reggie, but she never got through to them. And so finally, after almost 72 hours of not hearing from them, she decides to just hop in her car and drive the four 
hours to Jacksonville to check on them personally. When she got there, she saw her mother and Reggie's car was not in the driveway like it normally would be. And so Rhonda went up to the front door and she knocked and she's yelling for her mom, but nobody's coming to the door, even though lights are on inside the house. And so Rhonda eventually tries the handle of the door and it's open. And so she opens it up, she steps inside, she yells again for her mom and for Reggie, but no one yells back. And then she sees their beloved dog, Mikey, that they brought everywhere with them was still in the house. And so she's thinking, where would they have gone without bringing Mikey? And so Rhonda continues to walk through the house into the kitchen. And when she gets there, she sees on the table are two plates of food where the food looks like it's a couple of days old and it's just sitting on the plate like they had been eating it and then just abandoned it there. And then in the sink are all these dirty dishes. And then on the stove are half cooked pots of food. And Rhonda knows her mother is an extremely tidy person and she never would have left her house with dirty dishes and food out on the table. And so red flags are going up for Rhonda but what ultimately sealed the deal for her was when she turned and looked on one of the counters, she saw the cell phone that Reggie and Carol shared was still sitting there along with Carol's purse. And then next to that was both of their medications, which was Reggie's insulin and Carol's liver cancer medication, both of which were life-saving and needed to be taken every single day. There's no way they would have left the house without those things. And so Rhonda immediately calls the Jacksonville Police Department and she files a missing person report. And before long, the missing couple story is all over the news and all of the networks are asking people if they have information to come forward but no one came forward and so the only lead the police had was to track down the Sumner's car which was missing from their driveway when Rhonda showed up at their house. So the police shared the description of their vehicle all across the state and very quickly they got a hit. The car had been found abandoned in a Florida town about one hour west of Jacksonville. It had been parked in this semi-forested very secluded area off of a dirt road and there was nothing in side of it, but they saw the battery had been taken out, leading some of the officers to speculate that perhaps the Sumners really had just driven away from their home without telling anybody and then ran into car troubles. But that theory would quickly be thrown out the window when five hours later, the Jacksonville police received a very strange phone call. The man who called in said he was Reggie Sumner, and he said he had seen the news about him and his wife being missing and that that was just totally not true, that in reality, they had left, but they were just fine and they'd be back soon. The police are immediately suspicious of this person. They don't think it's Reggie Sumner because for one, he sounds like a young man and Reggie is a 61 year old. And so the voice didn't really line up. And just the way he was talking about this disappearance, like it was no big deal, that also just didn't really make sense. And so one of the officers asked Reggie, are you with your wife, Carol? And he said, yep, I'm with her, here she is. And so a woman hops on the phone who says she's Carol Sumner, but she sounds far too young to be Carol Sumner, who's 61. This sounds like a 18, 19, 20 year old girl. And she too just reiterates that everything's just fine. And they've gone out for a couple of days. There's nothing to worry about. And you know, you police can stop looking for us. And so after this call ends, the police at this point are convinced that this simply cannot be Carol and Reggie. But to make sure they call in Rhonda and they have her listen to the recording of this conversation with the so-called Reggie and Carol. And right away, Rhonda says, that's not my mom and that's not Reggie. And so at this point, the police assumed that these two people who called in pretending to be the Sumners probably had something to do with the disappearance of the real Sumners. And so while they waited for the trace on this phone call to come back, which would give them information about who was calling and from where, the police decided to investigate another angle. The police looked at the Sumners bank statements and they saw their bank card had been used at an ATM in South Carolina after the Sumners had been reported missing. And so they called that bank and they asked for the CCTV footage from that ATM. And when they watched it, they saw that it was not Carol or Reggie Sumner withdrawing funds. It was some unknown man in his early 20s. Right after this discovery of this unknown man, the trace from the phone conversation with the imposter Sumners came back, except it was tied to a fake name at a fake address. So that wasn't helpful to the police in their investigation. However, when they went through this cell phone's call logs, which they got with the phone trace, they saw whoever owned the cell phone had recently placed a call to a car rental company in South Carolina. And so the police call this car rental company and they speak to the manager and they're able to figure out that somebody using this cell phone number had indeed called and had rented a car and the car they rented matched the description of the car the unknown man was driving in the ATM surveillance footage. But this car had been rented to a woman. Her name was Tiffany Cole. The rental company told police 
police that all of their cars had satellite tracking information built into them. And so police were able to use that information to track Tiffany's rental car to a motel in South Carolina. The initial thought was that maybe the Sumners are being held against their will in this motel. And so very quickly, a police force was organized and on the morning of July 14th, so six days after the Sumners were listed as missing, they arrive at this motel, they go to the front desk, they find out what room Tiffany is in, they get the key and they go up and they open the door. The Sumners were not inside. Instead, there were three young adults sitting there. It was 24-year-old Tiffany Cole, her boyfriend, 23-year-old Michael James Jackson, and his friend, 19-year-old Alan Wade. Also in the room were dozens of bags of recently purchased merchandise, like computers and video games and clothes and perfume. And also they discovered the key to the Sumner's vehicle and Reggie Sumner's prized coin collection. The police brought all three back to the police station and put them in separate rooms to be interrogated. At this point, it was obvious to police that these three had something to do with the Sumner's disappearance. They had all these things in the room that tied them to the missing couple. And so now the police, as they interrogated them, it was not so much about connecting them to the Sumner's as much as it was about helping them find the Sumner's. At first, all three of them either didn't talk or were totally uncooperative, but under intense questioning, Tiffany cracked a little bit. She said that they had robbed the Sumners, but nothing more. They didn't do anything else besides rob them. And there had been a fourth person involved in the robbery, 19-year-old Bruce Nixon, who was friends with Alan Wade. Bruce lived nearby, so the police quickly rounded him up and brought him in for questioning. And unlike the other three, Bruce immediately caved. And the story he told about what happened to the Sumners brought many of the police that were involved in this investigation to tears. He said it all started with Tiffany. Tiffany used to be neighbors with the Sumners back when they still lived in South Carolina. Tiffany had a pretty rough upbringing and her father was permanently sick. And so the Sumners kind of took her under their wing and looked after her and built a very close relationship with her and kind of treated her like she was one of their daughters. Anything she needed, if she needed money, food, anything, they would give it to her. For example, in 2001, right before they left for Florida, they sold a car to Tiffany, but they sold it for basically nothing because they knew she didn't have any money and she really needed a car. Four years later, in June of 2005, Tiffany was partying in Jacksonville, Florida with her new boyfriend, Michael James Jackson, when they got kicked out of the house they planned on staying in for the night. And so now they don't have a place to stay, they don't have any money, and that's when Tiffany remembers the Sumners had moved to Jacksonville and they would always help her out if she needed anything. And so the two of them drive to the Sumners house in the middle of the night, they haven't called them, and they just knock on the door, totally uninvited, and Carol comes to the door and when she opens it, she sees Tiffany and immediately she's like, oh my goodness, I haven't seen you in so long come in come in who are you oh Michael great to meet you come on inside I'll get you food we'll get you fed what do you need what can we do for you and so that's when Tiffany explains to them that their plans had kind of fallen through and they didn't have a place to stay that night and would it be possible to stay with them and so Carol and Reggie right away say absolutely no problem Tiffany Michael you guys are guests here you're welcome stay as long as you want and so that night Carol cooked a big meal for them and they all sat down at the table and at some point Carol and Reggie talk about the sale of their house in South Carolina and somehow it came up that they had made $99,000 in profit from the sale. And they were so happy about it because now they could really retire comfortably. And so as soon as they said that, Tiffany and Michael shot glances at each other because they knew they had to come back and rob them. The next morning, Carol and Reggie got up early, they made coffee and they made breakfast, and they were hoping that Tiffany and Michael would stick around for the day and spend some more time with them. But Tiffany and Michael were very quick to want to leave. They said, thank you very much, we gotta hit the road. And so they left. And as soon as they get in the car, they start planning how they're gonna come back and rob the Sumners and get their hands on that $99,000. One month later, on the evening of July 8th, after all robbery preparations have been made, Bruce Nixon and Alan Wade show up at the Sumner house and they knock on the door. When the door opens, it's Carol and she doesn't recognize either of them, but being as kind and generous as she was, she said, hey boys, you know, what can I do for you? How can I help you? And this was exactly what Bruce and Alan were expecting based on what Tiffany told them. She said this couple would be very easy to exploit and they tell her that their car had broken down and they needed to use her phone. And so she's a little bit skeptical, but ultimately she says, sure, come on in. And so Bruce and Alan go inside the house, the 
door shuts behind them. And as soon as it does, one of them draws a fake gun that looks very real and pointed it at Carol while the other one began tying her up with cord and with duct tape. And so Carol begins screaming and making a bunch of noise. And Reggie, who's in the garage out of sight, he hears her. He comes running in to see what's going on. And he sees these two men who immediately attack him. And Reggie's got a broken leg and he's already pretty weak and frail. And so he doesn't put up much of a fight. And before long, he and his wife were all taped up and restrained on the couch. And they were having duct tape wrapped around their heads until everything was covered except for a slit underneath their nose so they could breathe. And so with the couple completely under control and at the mercy of their captors, one of the men texted Michael, who was down the road with Tiffany inside of Tiffany's rental car, and the text just said, all clear. And what that meant was Michael could now come up and help them rob the house. And so Tiffany stays down the road in the rental car. Michael makes his way up. He goes inside and he, Bruce and Alan, proceeded to ransack the house. And while these three men are moving room to room, taking all of their valuables, Reggie and Carol are probably thinking to themselves that, you know what, this is awful, we're getting robbed, but after they take whatever they take and they leave, we'll be fine, we'll recover. But when these three men finish taking all of their valuable items, they decided that they would also take Reggie and Carol. So they stood the couple up and they marched them into the garage and they put them in the trunk of their own car. At this point, Bruce left the Sumner's house and went down the road and got in Tiffany's rental car. And Michael and Alan, they got into the Sumner's car and the two cars met up on the road and then drove 40 minutes northwest just over the border into Georgia where they found this access road and they went down it until they reached this very secluded section of forest. This was not just some random spot in the middle of the woods in Georgia, this was a pre-selected spot that Tiffany and the others had been out to two days earlier to prepare it. And what they had done to prepare was to dig a grave for the Sumners. Michael and Alan in the Sumners car drove up right next to the grave site while Tiffany and Bruce came up right behind them. And once they had all stopped, they got out of the car and they went right behind the Sumners car and they popped open the trunk. It's believed the temperature inside of that trunk was well over 100 degrees. And so Reggie and Carol were sweating profusely and the sweat had caused their restraints to slip off their wrists and slip down off their face. And so the two of them were found holding on to each other and crying and praying. Seeing how weak they already were, the group decided they did not need to put new tape around their wrists or their face. They weren't going to go anywhere. And so they grabbed the two and they pulled them out and dumped them on the ground. It was probably around this time that the Sumners realized Tiffany was one of these four people that was doing this horrible thing to them. And I can only imagine the heartbreak they experienced. This girl that they took in under their wing that they thought of as a daughter was betraying them in such a heinous and horrible way. But there was no time to feel upset about it because as soon as they were dumped on the ground, Michael grabbed Reggie and kind of threw him over to the side and said, sit down, don't move, or I'm gonna kill you and your wife. And then the others grabbed Carol and dragged her away from her husband over to the edge of the grave where they literally ripped the jewelry off of her face and off of her body. And then after all the jewelry was gone, they pushed her into the grave. Then they walked over to Reggie and dragged him over and threw him in with his wife. As soon as the couple was in the grave together, they repositioned themselves so they were both sitting up one in front of the other with Carol behind Reggie. And she threw her legs and her arms around Reggie, just kind of clutching onto him. And she buried her head into his back and she began crying. The original plan apparently had been to take the Sumners and put them in this grave and pretend like you were gonna do something to them to scare them into giving up all of their information, all of their banking information and anything else that was valuable. And it worked. And so as Carol is crying into Reggie's back, Reggie is pleading with the group. He's pleading to them, let me give you everything I have, whatever you need, it's yours. And so Michael said, give me all your ATM bank card numbers, give me your pin numbers, everything. And so Reggie did, he gave him all the information he could possibly give to him. And then for some reason, despite the fact that at this point, the group has taken everything of value from this poor couple. They have extracted all the valuable information they could possibly get from them, despite that. They decide that that's not enough. They need to kill the Sumners. And they need to kill them in the worst way imaginable. They need to bury them alive. For hours, the group slowly, shovelful by shovelful, 
filled in this hole with Reggie and Carol sitting at the bottom begging for their lives. But the group didn't care at all. They just kept shoveling dirt down on top of them until the dirt and mud had gotten up to their necks and the weight of the dirt was pressing in on their chests and was making it really hard to breathe. And so as Carol and Reggie are feeling this happening to them, they can feel themselves being crushed under this weight. Their cries for help become more and more desperate but more spaced apart because their breathing at this point is so labored, it's so hard to get a full breath that they're conserving their air at this point. And then at some point, as the dirt crept closer and closer to their mouths, they had to tilt their heads up to try to get a good breath of air. But when they did that, they began shoveling dirt directly onto their faces, causing them to choke and gag. They're inhaling this, and it's becoming nearly impossible to catch a breath. They're dying at this point. And so finally, another layer of dirt was thrown on top of them, and they disappeared under the soil but their sounds didn't go away. They continued to whimper and make sounds as more and more dirt was put down until finally they had filled in the hole and they began packing the dirt down with the backs of their shovels and they could hear underneath the soil still the sounds of this couple dying. This was a slow and horrible death. After the killers were done, they left the site and they took the Sumner's car and they dumped it in Florida where it was ultimately found. And then they all piled into the rental car. They went to an ATM and pulled some of the Sumner's money out and then went on a spending spree. Here is a photo of Tiffany celebrating just hours after killing the very people that had taken her in and treated her like a daughter. After their autopsies, the medical examiner explained that both Reggie and Carol had dirt packed into their nose into their mouths, in their throats, in their stomach, and in their lungs, meaning their actual cause of death was being buried alive. In exchange for telling investigators what happened and for leading them to the gravesite where the Sumners were, Bruce Nixon was spared the death penalty and given a life sentence. As for Michael, Allen, and Tiffany, they were all sentenced to death. If you got something out of today's episode and you haven't done this already, please go into the Like Button's favorite music playlist and replace all of the songs with the Kids Bop versions of them. In 1938, a farmer in southeastern Australia decided to bring his horses to a watering hole on the other side of his large property. As he was leading the horses across this big, wide open field, one of his horses suddenly just collapsed to the ground. The farmer ran over to see what was going on, but as soon as he got over to it, the horse had stood back up again and seemed totally unhurt. The farmer was puzzled because he had no idea why the horse fell in the first place, and so he looked down to see if maybe it tripped on something, and he saw on the ground right beneath the horse was this small hole. And so he moved his horse out of the way, and then when he came back to look at this thing, he saw it was only maybe a foot across, but when he peered down into it, he saw it was very deep. And so he got down on his hands and knees to get a closer look, and when his eyes adjusted, he could not believe what he was seeing. 10 or 15 feet below the surface was this huge pool of clear water. The horse had just stepped into the roof of an underground cave. And so the farmer was really excited to see how big this cave was. And so he grabbed all his horses and he brought them back to the stable. And he got this long measuring rope with a weight at the end of it. So he runs back out to the hole, he puts the weight into the hole, and he begins paying out this rope. And so down it goes, 10 feet, 20 feet, 30 feet, it just keeps on going and going, until finally the weight hits solid land at 120 feet. And so the farmer is like, wow, this is a huge cave. So he pulls it back up thinking that's the bottom, but in reality it wasn't. It actually extended down almost 300 additional feet. The farmer and his horse had just accidentally found one of the most beautiful and deadly freshwater caves in the world called the Shaft. The reason it's called the Shaft is because the only way in or out of this underwater cave is through this hole in the middle of this field that this horse created, and it's literally a shaft that goes down 18 feet until it reaches the surface of this massive underground body of water. The opening to this shaft is so narrow that cave divers, they can't get into it with their gear on their backs. So they literally need to be lowered into this cave by themselves, and then their gear is lowered down after them, and they put it on while they're treading water. The solid ground that the farmer's weighted line had touched at 120 feet when he believed he had reached the bottom of the cave, what he had actually touched was the top of something called the rock pile. The 
the rock pile is basically this huge underwater pyramid that looks like a rock pile that sits at the bottom in the middle of this huge underwater cave. And from the top of this rock pile, you can go down it in all different directions, but once you get to the bottom, there's only two tunnels to choose from. There's one that goes west, basically down at an angle, that dead ends at 260 feet. And then on the other side of this underwater pyramid is the eastern tunnel, and that's much more treacherous. It goes down at a more steep angle to 400 feet. The few elite divers that have explored the deepest recesses of this cave say there are three distinct stages to it. Stage one is from the surface down to 120 feet, the top of the rock pile. During this stage, the diver swims unobstructed in beautiful clear water with sunlight poking through the hole. It's a very easy section of the cave and there's a safety line that's anchored from the surface straight down to the top of the rock pile. So you have something to hold on to as you go down and back up. Stage two is where things get a bit dicey. Stage two begins at the top of the rock pile and extends down all the way to the bottom of the westerly tunnel at 260 feet where it dead ends, or down to the 200 foot mark of the easterly tunnel where you come to something called the drop off ledge. And it's quite literally a ledge in the middle of this tunnel where beyond it, there's a fairly steep drop off and it leads down to an area that's so treacherous, it's got its own stage. Starting with stage two and then with stage three, there is no safety line to guide you in the direction you need to go. So you're on your own as soon as you reach the top of the rock pile. And so you make your way down any direction you want down the rock pile until you reach either of these tunnels and as soon as you go into them, you immediately start to lose visibility because the sunlight cannot penetrate all the way into these tunnels. And so the diver becomes increasingly reliant on their flashlight. As such, they have to be very careful as they navigate down stage two to not bump into the walls because doing so will knock the limestone silt off of the walls. It will create a cloud of it in their face. It will blind them. It's like being in fog where a flashlight can't push through it. And so the diver has to either wait for the silt to clear, which could take a very long time, or they have to swim blind. Also, anyone entering stage two and stage three, they can't breathe regular air out of their tanks. There's too much nitrogen in regular air. The deeper you dive, the more nitrogen your body will absorb. And if you have too much nitrogen in your system, it can give you something called nitrogen narcosis, which is like being really drunk. And in extreme cases, people have been known to take their mouthpiece out and inhale water, believing they're on the surface, or they'll confuse the direction up with the direction down. And to get to the surface, they will swim straight down until it's too late and they can't get back up again. And so divers that are going to be in stage two or stage three of this cave will breathe a special mix of gases that are low in nitrogen. The final stage of the shaft, stage three, is just from the 200 foot mark of the easterly cave, so that drop off ledge, all the way down to the bottom at 400 feet. This stage is unbelievably dangerous. As soon as you drop off that ledge, all the sunlight goes away. It is pitch black and the tunnel narrows considerably and stays incredibly narrow. In fact, many times divers have to squeeze themselves past sections where the rocks are too close together. And so because you're inherently bumping into the walls all through stage three, you're pretty much guaranteed to be silted out the entire time. At this depth, nitrogen narcosis is virtually guaranteed, even if you're breathing a special low nitrogen mix of gases. And so divers need to be ready to abort the dive at any moment if they feel symptoms coming on. Once the diver has turned around and is making their return trip, but they're still in the third stage section of the cave, they need to be careful of false stones. These are offshoots on the ceiling only in this third stage that look like the way out. And especially when things are silted out and it's dark, you're low on oxygen, you might be panicking, it'd be very easy to confuse these with the way out. But in fact, these false domes are exactly what their name implies. They are false, they are dead ends, they go nowhere. Stage three is reserved exclusively for extremely experienced cave divers who get special permission. In 1973, eight divers got permission to dive the first and second stages of the shaft cave. They did not get permission to dive the third stage of the cave. On May 28th of that year, the eight divers arrived in that big open field near the cave opening and began prepping their gear. Their plan was to dive down all the way to the edge of the drop off ledge. So looking into the third stage and then once they got there look around for a minute and then turn around and head back up to the surface. These eight divers were experienced divers, but their experience was all in open water environments. None of them had dove in a cave. And so they were confident divers, but they were a little bit naive. 
They believed the dive down to the edge of the third stage was going to be fairly routine and would just be simple and fun. But before any of them had even gotten into the water, they had already made a critical mistake. Instead of jamming their bottle with the special low nitrogen mixed gas that they would need since they were going into stage two, and so that's a requirement, instead of doing that, they just jammed their bottles with regular air. So they were basically guaranteeing that they would get nitrogen narcosis. But once they had all their gear prepped, they made their way over to the entrance to the shaft and one by one they were lowered down into the water and their gear would follow. And then once all of them were all jocked up, they grabbed the safety line and they began their descent. It only took about two minutes to get down to the top of the rock pile. And there they spent about five minutes taking pictures of each other before heading down the Eastern tunnel. Three of the divers were siblings, Glenn, Stephen, and Christine, who were 25, 22, and 19 respectively. And Glenn remembers after they made their way all the way down the Eastern Tunnel and they reached the drop-off ledge, he remembers seeing his sister, his brother, and all the other divers. Everyone seemed just fine. Everyone's just looking over this ledge. They're taking turns, kind of peering down into this black abyss that is stage three. And then after five minutes or so, Glenn looked at his gauge and he saw his air was getting fairly low, not emergency situation, but it was time to leave. Leave, and everybody else had the same amount of air as he did and so everybody else was running low on air and so Glenn was about to grab his sister who was several feet right in front of him she was still looking over the ledge down into stage three but when he reached out to grab her she and all the other divers just suddenly jumped forward and dove straight down into the abyss out of sight they dove into the stage three section this was not something that Glenn was tracking anybody doing this was not something anyone said they were going to do this was not part of the dive. This was very dangerous and they weren't allowed to go down there. And so Glenn immediately swam down after them to try to grab his sister and stop her or grab his brother or grab any of them. But as soon as he went over that ledge, he saw it was totally pitch black and it was completely silted out from all these divers suddenly launching over the edge. And so Glenn knows he's not going to find them in the silt. It's also very dangerous for him alone to just dive down there. And so he figures, you know what, I'm sure they're fine. They probably planned this out and they're just going to go down a little ways and they'll come back up again. And so I'll just go to the rock pile and wait for them. And so Glenn turns around and he goes up back over the drop off ledge. He makes his way to the rock pile and he just sits there facing the east Eastern tunnel waiting for his brother his sister and the other divers to come back out again but they don't and finally his air gauge gets so low that he literally has to go to the surface and he's thinking to himself if my air is this low what are they doing down there 24-year-old Larry Reynolds was one of the divers that went with Glenn's sister and brother and the other two divers into this forbidden third stage section of the cave. Although he doesn't say this, it sounded like he and the others just wanted to go a little ways into this off-limit section, check it out, and then turn around and go back to the surface. And so Larry would say, as soon as they went over the ledge and they're in this third stage, it went completely pitch black and the tunnel immediately constricted dramatically. And so as they're going down this very tight and pitch black tunnel, they reach a section that's so tight, they're down on their stomachs, literally pulling themselves through. And so after a few minutes of the group forcing themselves into this unbelievably dangerous place, it's like they all collectively realized, this is a terrible idea, we need to turn back. And so as they all began turning around, they realized their return trip just back up to the drop off ledge, which was only maybe 25 feet, was completely silted out. And so Larry is in the back of this return trip line and right in front of him is Christine. And so as soon as they all make their way into the silt, the only thing Larry can see with his flashlight is Christine's fins. And so he's staying right up on her and keeping his light on that fin to make sure he's going in the right direction. And so after only a few moments, Christine's fins just suddenly disappear. And so Larry's thinking, I don't know where she went, but I don't have enough time. I have almost no air. And so he just keeps on swimming, believing he's going the right way. And sure enough, he clears out of the silt and he goes up and back over the drop off ledge and he shines his light back up the eastern tunnel back up towards the rock pile expecting to see Christine and the other divers he was just with but he's looking and there's no one there there's no silt it's totally clear and there's not one diver in front of him and so he looks at his gauge again and he's got a little bit of air enough to maybe go down and make sure nobody is still down there because he's thinking I don't think it's possible they could have swam all the way through this tunnel in this space of time 
So he turns around, he goes back over the drop-off ledge, back into the silt, and as he's moving very slowly and cautiously, up ahead he sees flashlights moving around on the ceiling of the tunnel. And so he moves down towards this flashing light, and he realizes the light is coming from inside of a false dome right above him. And so he looks up, and he saw there was Christine and another man named Roberts, who was 28, frantically swimming around, shining their lights, looking for the way out, not realizing they're in this dead end. And so Larry was about to shine his light to get their attention when Larry's flashlight went out. And so now Larry is in complete darkness. He is completely silted out. He doesn't even know how much air he has left because he can't shine the light on it. And so he's starting to panic. He starts banging on his flashlight and finally the light comes back on. And when it does, he shines it straight up again to try to shine it towards Christine and Roberts. But he had drifted farther down the tunnel. And so by the time he shined his light, he wasn't underneath the false dome. But when he shined his light in the other direction, he saw he was at the very far end of where the group had gone. And so farther down into stage three was clear. There was no silt. And so he shined his light down into the stage three tunnel and way down the tunnel, barely visible. He sees there is one diver with his flashlight out swimming the wrong direction down into oblivion. His name was John, he was 20 years old, and he almost certainly had nitrogen narcosis. Larry knew he could not save him. And so Larry turned around and went back into the silt, back up in the direction of the rock pile, touching the ceiling, looking for that entrance into the false dome to try to help Christine and Roberts. But he's not finding it, and he's looking at his air gauge, and it's getting critically low, and he knows if he doesn't go soon, he's gonna die. And so at some point, after not finding the entrance to this false dome, he decides he just has to go out and save himself. And so he manages to get out of the silt. He goes up and over the drop-off ledge. He gets to the rock pile. He grabs the safety line and he fins himself up to the surface. And when he gets to the surface, he looks around and there's only three other divers up there, one of which is Glenn. And Glenn, he looks visibly panicked and he yells to Larry, hey, have you seen my brother and my sister? Have you seen the others? Are they coming up after you? And Larry looks at him and just shakes his head. He didn't know what to say. He knew they were gone. But for Glenn, this was his baby brother, his baby sister he had to go back down and so with the little bit of air he had left he put his mouthpiece in he turned around and he dove straight down as fast as he could staring towards the opening of the eastern tunnel praying that his family members that his friends are going to come out of there but as he's swimming down and he's running out of air no one was coming out of that tunnel and so finally when his air was basically empty he had to turn around and on that return trip back to the surface he realized his siblings and his two friends were gone it would take 11 months and 11 days to finally locate and recover all four of the bodies inside of the cave. John, the 20-year-old who Larry saw swimming in the wrong direction, was found fairly far down the eastern tunnel laying on a rocky outcropping. Glenn's 22-year-old brother Stephen was found just 50 feet from the entrance of the shaft, but it's believed he died at a much lower depth and then floated up to that position. Glenn's 19-year-old sister Christine and the 28-year-old man Roberts that she was with inside of the false dome were found embracing each other just under the false dome inside of the tunnel. Investigators believe when they were in there, they couldn't find the exit and then realized that they had so little air that even if they found the exit, they would not get out in time. And so knowing they were just minutes away from death, they abandoned looking for the exit and instead just embraced each other while they died. And then afterwards, they floated down and out of the false stone. After this tragedy, the shaft was permanently closed to all divers, but years later, they would reopen it. If you got something out of today's episode and you haven't done this already, please offer to take the like button out to a very nice restaurant outside of town. And when they get out of their car, tell them that you only offered to take them there and proceed to drive away. Chundawats were a big, tight-knit, middle-class family who lived in a cramped city in northern Delhi, India. For generations, their family had been farmers living and working out in the desert. But in 1989, their beloved patriarch, Bhopal Singh, decided it was time for a change. That year, he sold all of his farmlands and then used the money from that sale to move with his wife and his youngest son to the city. And over the next couple of decades, one by one, the rest of Bhopal's children and their families followed him out there to the city and moved 
moved in with him. By 2007, there were 12 Chundawats all living under one roof. They made their living by running a grocery slash plywood shop on the first floor of their house. The store was quite prosperous, not only because the goods they sold were top notch, but also because the locals just really liked being around the Chundawats. Bhopal was this big friendly personality that took on a sort of fatherly role in the neighborhood, and so locals began calling him daddy just like his family did. Bhopal's wife, Narayan, took on a motherly role in the neighborhood and so naturally was nicknamed Mommy. When she wasn't taking care of her own family, she'd be outside handing out tea to workers on the street or looking after neighborhood kids. The rest of Bhopal's family, which included his three adult children, two of their wives, and five grandchildren, were also often seen down at the store and they were highly regarded and respected as well. By all accounts, the Chundawats seemed like very successful and happy people that kind of had a perfect life. But in 2007, they would face a crisis when Bhopal died. Knowing how much he meant to that family, neighbors were concerned that the family would fall apart without him. But surprisingly, immediately following his death, it was like the family started improving in all aspects of their life. It was like an already perfect family got even better. They began working extra long hours at their store, and before long, they had earned enough money to open another store and put an addition on their house. They improved their health by changing their diet and cutting alcohol and tobacco out of their lives. Their children, who were already very gifted students, began studying even more and did even better in school. And the whole family, from the youngest to the oldest, became exponentially more devout. While neighbors certainly noticed these changes in the Chundawats, none of them raised any eyebrows. In fact, people were impressed. This incredible family has managed to come out of a huge crisis, better off and happier for it. Little did they know that behind the scenes, something totally Totally sinister was driving these changes. Fast forward 11 years to July 1st, 2018. That morning, like every other morning, locals began lining up outside of the Chundawats grocery store, waiting for them to open their doors. The Chundawats were known to be extremely punctual, and at 6 a.m. sharp every day, they opened those doors. But this morning, 6 a.m. came and went, and the store stayed dark and the doors stayed closed. People began calling the Chundawats, but none of them had their phone on. And so eventually, a 79-year-old neighbor decided they would just walk up the steps to the Chundawats' house and check on them themselves. And so up they went, they knocked on the door, they yelled out for the family, but nobody came to the door, everything was off. And so eventually, they just tried the doorknob and twisted it, and it turned. He swings it open and he yells out the family's name, and as soon as the door flings open and he can see inside, he nearly faints. He backpedals, he screams, he runs down to the street, and he yells for someone to call the police. Luckily, there was a police officer in the area, and so very quickly they came over and they cleared the crowd out of the way that was forming at the base of the Chundawat steps. They were all looking up to see whatever this neighbor had seen. And before the officer actually ascended the stairs, someone told him what was seen inside of the house. And so he's mentally preparing himself for what he's about to walk into. He walks up the stairs and he pauses right before turning the corner when he's gonna actually see inside the house. He takes a deep breath, he knows what he's gonna see, he turns the corner, he walks inside, and he's still completely shocked at what he's seeing. He would only be able to stay inside of the house that first trip for about 10 seconds before he too turned around and ran out of there. He would say it was just too much, it was one of the worst things he had ever seen, and that he hopes he never has to see anything like that ever again in his career. Eventually, the police would go back inside the Chundawat's house, and after looking around, they would find 11 hidden diaries. And in these diaries would be the full, awful story Story of what happened to that family. In the first few days following Bhopal's death in 2007, the family called a priest to lead them in a prayer honoring their lost loved one. And during this prayer, Lalit, who was Bhopal's youngest son at the time he was in his 30s, he began chanting. And as soon as he did, the rest of his family stopped what they were doing and just stared at him. They couldn't believe what they were hearing. A few years earlier, Lalit had been in this horrible accident where plywood had fallen off of a shelf and hit him in the head, nearly killing him, he survived the ordeal, but the damage to his head left him unable to speak. But now, here he is chanting and speaking. And so as his voice grew stronger and stronger as he was doing this chant, the other family members just continued to watch him and listen to him, and then they began whispering to each other, Daddy has returned. 
Following this prayer session, Lalit kept his voice and he began keeping a diary, the first of the 11 he would ultimately fill. The first few entries in that first diary were fairly normal. They were just reflections on his day or on his life, but pretty quickly, the entries took a major turn. The first strange entry occurred on September 7, 2007. To that point, Lalit had been writing in kind of narrative format about his life and whatever it was he was writing about, but it just kind of abruptly stopped and in its place was this really deliberate instruction for his family. It said they all needed to get a black and white photo of Bhopal, their patriarch, and put it in front of them and then pray they're able to rid themselves of their old habits. From this point onward, the diary entries became more frequent and they stayed in this kind of strange instruction format for the family. It was like it was a growing list of rules for the family to follow. And the tone of these instructions that Lalit is writing out in this diary became more and more aggressive and punitive and hectoring. It was like the family was being punished but the family appeared to obey all of these instructions. And this was because Lalit told his family that Bhopal had come back from the dead, he had given Lalit his voice back, and he had spoken to Lalit and explained to him that the reason he was back is because he wanted to save his family's souls. Lalit explained that at night, Bhopal would possess his body, and then using Lalit's body, he would write these instructions in the diary for his family to follow. And the idea was, if you follow these instructions, that will set you on the path to saving your soul. His instructions were at first just simple ways to honor Bhopal, but quickly they became really specific directives of how each of the family members needed to live their life on a day-to-day -day basis. There were instructions about which food they were allowed to eat and when they were allowed to eat it. There were instructions about which things they could sell in their store, and there were instructions on how to invest their profits, and there were countless instructions on how they should be praying and when they should be praying. Every night, just before 9 p.m., the family was instructed to stop whatever they were doing and head back to the house. And if anybody asked them what they were doing, they were supposed to tell them that grandfather was coming. And so they would all convene in a room inside of their house and they would wait. And then at some point, Lalit would walk into the room, he would sit down in front, and then right at 9 p.m., he would become possessed by Bhopal. And then Bhopal would lead a 15 to 30 minute long prayer. Eventually, Lalit began observing a vow of silence, and he told his family that if and when you hear my voice again, it's not Lalit, you're only hearing Bhopal. In the eyes of his family, Lalit was no longer Lalit. Lalit had become Bhopal, or I guess Bhopal had become Lalit. But either way, Bhopal was back, and so with the exception of Lalit's mother, everyone in his family began referring to him as Daddy. Over the years this went on, the neighbors did pick up on the family's strange behavior, specifically Lalit's strange behavior. But no one ever said anything about it, because despite the weirdness, the family seemed like they were really flourishing. They looked healthier, they were making more money, the grandchildren were excelling in school, and and they just generally looked really happy. And so fast forward to June of 2018, which is the month before the neighbor and then police officer sees this horrible thing in the Chundawat household. That month, June, was an especially happy time for the Chundawat family because one of the grandchildren had announced they were going to get married. And so on June 17th, they have this huge engagement party. The whole family's there. They're dancing for joy about this incredible announcement. And then they began shifting their focus to planning this wedding that everyone is so excited about. A couple of weeks later, on June 29th, the Chundawats had their neighbor over for dinner, and that neighbor would later say that nothing seemed to miss, and over dinner, all the family wanted to talk about was this incredible wedding they were planning, and how excited they were to go to it. And this wedding was several months away. Less than 48 hours after this dinner, the Chundawats failed to open their grocery store, and so the neighbor goes up the stairs, he opens the door, and he sees 10 members of the 11-person Chundawat family dangling from New in the front hallway. They were hanging very close together in a circular pattern that looked very intentional. Their hands and their feet were bound, they were blindfolded with strips of cloth, their mouths were taped shut, and their ears were packed with cotton balls. On the ground underneath them were black stools that had toppled over. The 11th and final member of the Chundawat family, which was the 77-year-old widow of Bhopal, was found dead laying in a bed nearby with a belt right next to her. The initial thought by police is this was a mass murder. But after reading the last few entries of Lalit's final diary, they realized it wasn't. Lalit had convinced his family that just abiding by Bhopal's strict instructions that he gave them in the diary 
that was not enough to save their souls. What they needed to do was participate in a ritual he was calling Vat Tapasya, which means worship at the hanging roots of the banyan tree. Eight days before their bodies were found, the family who agreed to do this ritual began practicing for it. And every night they'd work on binding their hands and their feet and then unbinding themselves. And they would tie nooses and put it around their neck and they would tighten them. And then they'd loosen them and take them off and they'd do it to each other until they were very good at doing all of those things. The day before their bodies were found, the family performed what's called a hawan, which is a ceremony of burnt offerings. And then afterwards they ordered food and then tied their dog up outside. At 10 p.m., one of the grandchildren and her mother left the house and went to a store and then were caught on camera walking back to the house carrying these black stools that they would later use in the ritual. Just after midnight, it was time for the family to get in position. The parents helped their children put on their bindings, they got them up on their stool, and they put their nooses around their neck and cinched it down tight and told them to wait. And then afterwards, they did the same thing to themselves. At this point, Lalit's mother most likely realized she was not able to climb up onto the stool because she was hurting or she was tired. And so a decision was made to move her into the bedroom. And so she, along with Lalit and Lalit's wife, Tina, walked into the bedroom. And once she was laying down on the bed, Lalit put a belt around her neck. And then he and Tina pulled on it until his mother went still. And then afterwards, he took the belt off, put it next to her. And then Lalit and Tina casually walked back to towards the front hallway where the eight other family members were now in position. They're blindfolded with cotton in their ear. They have their noose on, they're just waiting. And Lalit and Tina walk around the room, kicking their stools out from underneath them. And while their family slowly asphyxiates all around them, Lalit and Tina bind up their wrists and their ankles. They get on their stool, they blindfold themselves, they tape their mouth, they put cotton in their ears, they put their nooses on, they cinch them down, and then they both jump. The very last line in the final diary that Lalit kept it says, keep water in a cup. I will appear and save when color changes. This ritual was supposed to allow the family to see Bhopal in person. Lalit told them that as soon as they were hanging, the skies would open up, the earth would tremble, and Bhopal would walk right into the room and save them from their death. And they were going to be able to prove that he was there because not only would they have lived through this ritual, but also Bhopal was going to change the color of the water in the cup that was left out near their bodies. The family had even left the front door unlocked to make it even easier for Bhopal to come in and save them. The Chundawats were not committing suicide. They believed they were going to survive this ritual. This is why just two days earlier at that dinner with the neighbor, they were eagerly talking about this wedding that was off in the future they were planning because they believed they would get to attend it, even though they knew in two days they'd be performing this thought to pass your ritual. Ultimately, investigators closed the case as a mass suicide, citing the cause as shared delusion. If you got something out of today's episode and you haven't done this already, please invite the like button to come over your house and play Call of Duty with you, but give them the NES Duck Hunt remote as their controller.